Section 26 of Select Works of Martin Luther, Volume 1, translated by Henry Cole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Gillian Hendry. Righteousness and Justification by Faith. Galatians, Chapter 3, Verse 6. As Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. The Apostle now addeth the example of Abraham, and rehearseth the testimony of the Scripture. The first is out of Genesis, chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and so on. This place the Apostle here mightily prosecuteth, as also he did in his epistle to the Romans. Quote, if Abraham, saith he, was justified by the works of the law, he hath righteousness and rejoicing, but not before God, but before men. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. For before God there is nothing in him but sin and wrath. Now he was justified before God, not because he did work, but because he did believe. For the scripture saith, quote, Abraham believed, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. End quote. This place doth Paul there notably set forth and amplify as is most worthy. Abraham, saith he, was not weak in the faith, neither considered he his own body, which was now dead, being almost a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb, neither did he doubt of the promise through unbelief, but was strengthened in the faith and gave glory to God, being fully assured that whatever God had promised, he was able to do. Now it is not written for him only that it was imputed to him for righteousness, but for us also, end quote, and so on. Romans chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Paul, by these words, Abraham believed, maketh of faith in God the chiefest worship, the chiefest duty, the chiefest obedience, and the chiefest sacrifice. Let him that is a rhetorician amplify this place, and he shall see that faith is an almighty thing, and that the power thereof is infinite and inestimable, for it giveth glory unto God, which is the highest service that can be given unto him. Now to give glory unto God is to believe in him, to count him true, wise, righteous, merciful, almighty. Briefly, to acknowledge him to be the author and giver of all goodness. This reason doth not, but faith. That is it which maketh us divine people. And as a man would say, it is the creator of certain divinity, not in the substance of God, but in us. For without faith, God loseth in us his glory, wisdom, righteousness, truth, and mercy. To conclude, no majesty or divinity remaineth unto God where faith is not, and the chiefest thing that God requireth of man is that he give unto him his glory and his divinity, that is to say, that he taketh him not for an idol, but for God, who regardeth him, heareth him, showeth mercy unto him, and helpeth him. This being done, God hath his full and perfect divinity, that is, he hath whatsoever a faithful heart can attribute unto him. To be able, therefore, to give that glory unto God is the wisdom of wisdoms, the righteousness of righteousnesses, the religion of religions, and the sacrifice of sacrifices. Hereby we may perceive what a high and excellent righteousness faith is, and so, by the contrary, what a horrible and grievous sin infidelity is. Whosoever then believeth the word of God, as Abraham did, is righteous before God, because he hath faith which giveth glory to God, that is, he giveth to God that which is due to him. For faith saith thus, I believe thee, O God, when thou speakest. And what saith God? Impossible things, lies, foolish, weak, absurd, abominable, heretical, and devilish things, if ye believe reason. For what is more absurd, foolish, and impossible, that when God saith to Abraham that he should have a son of the barren and dead body of his wife Sarah. So if we will follow the judgment of reason, God setteth forth absurd and impossible things when he setteth out unto us the articles of the Christian faith. Indeed, it seemeth to reason an absurd and a foolish thing that in the Lord's Supper is offered unto us the body and blood of Christ, that baptism is the laver of the new birth and of the renewing of the Holy Ghost that the dead shall rise at the last day, that Christ, the Son of God, was conceived and carried in the womb of the Virgin Mary, that he was born, that he suffered the most reproachful death of the cross, that he was raised up again, that he now sitteth at the right hand of God the Father, 
and that he hath power both in heaven and in earth. For this cause, Paul calleth the gospel of Christ crucified, the word of the cross, and foolish preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 Which to the Jews was offensive, and to the Gentiles foolish doctrine. Wherefore, reason doth not understand that to hear the word of God and to believe it is the chiefest service that God requireth of us. But it thinketh that those things which it chooseth and doth of a good intent, as they call it, and of her own devotion, please God. Therefore, when God speaketh, reason judgeth his word to be heresy and the word of the devil, for it seemeth unto it absurd and foolish. But faith killeth reason and slayeth that beast which the whole world and all creatures cannot kill. So Abraham killed it by faith in the word of God, whereby seed was promised unto him of Sarah, who was barren, and now past childbearing. Unto this word reason yieldeth not straightway in Abraham, but it fought against faith in him, judging it to be an absurd, a foolish, and impossible thing, that Sarah, who was now not only ninety years old, but also was barren by nature, should bring forth a son. Thus faith wrestled with reason in Abraham, but herein faith got the victory, and killed and crucified reason, that most cruel and pestilent enemy of God. So all the godly, entering with Abraham into the darkness of faith, do still reason, saying, Reason, thou art foolish, thou dost not savour those things which belong unto God. Therefore speak not against me, but hold thy peace. Judge not, but hear the word of God, and believe it. So the godly by faith kill such a beast as is greater than the whole world, and thereby do offer unto God a most acceptable sacrifice and service. And, in comparison of this sacrifice of the faithful, all the religions of all nations, and all the works of all monks and merit-mongers, are nothing at all. For by this sacrifice, first, as I said, they kill reason, a great and mighty enemy of God. For reason despiseth God, and denieth his wisdom, justice, power, truth, mercy, majesty, and divinity. Moreover, by the same sacrifice, they yield glory unto God. That is, they believe him to be just, good, faithful, true, and so on. They believe that he can do all things, that all his words are holy, true, lively, and effectual, and so on, which is a most acceptable obedience unto God. Wherefore, there can be no greater or more holy religion in the world, nor more acceptable unto God than faith is. Contrariwise, the justiciaries and such as seek righteousness by their own works, lacking faith, do many things. They fast, they pray, they watch, they lay crosses upon themselves. But because they think to appease the wrath of God and deserve grace by these things, they give no glory to God. That is, they do not judge him to be merciful, true, and keeping promise, and so on. But to be an angry judge, which must be pacified with works. And by this means, they despise God and make him a liar in all his promises, and they deny Christ and all his benefits. To conclude, they thrust God out of his seat and set themselves in his place. For they, rejecting and despising the word of God, do choose unto themselves such a service of God and such works as God hath not commanded. They imagine that God hath a pleasure therein, and they hope to receive a reward of him for the same. Therefore they kill not reason, that mighty enemy of God, but quicken it, and they take from God his majesty and his divinity, and attribute the same unto their own works. Wherefore only faith giveth glory to God, as Paul witnesseth of Abraham. Quote, Abraham, saith he, was strong in the faith, and gave glory to God, being fully assured that whatsoever God had promised, he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. End quote. Romans chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. Christian righteousness consisteth in the faith of the heart and God's imputation. It is not without cause that he addeth this sentence out of the 15th chapter of Genesis, quote, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. End quote. For Christian righteousness consisteth in two things that is to say, in the faith of the heart and in God's imputation. Faith is indeed a formal righteousness, and yet this righteousness is not enough, for after faith there remain yet certain remnants of sin in our flesh. This sacrifice of faith began in Abraham, but at the last it was finished in his death. Wherefore, 
The other part of righteousness must needs be added also to finish the same in us, that is to say, God's imputation. For faith giveth not enough to God, because it is imperfect. Yea, rather, our faith is but a little spark of faith, which beginneth to render unto God his true divinity. We have received the first fruits of the Spirit, but not yet the tenths. Besides this, reason is not utterly killed in this life, which may appear by our concupiscence, wrath, impatiency, and other fruits of the flesh, and of infidelity yet remaining in us. Yea, the holiest that live have not yet a full and continual joy in God, but have their sundry passions, sometimes sad, sometimes merry, as the scriptures witness of the prophets and apostles. But such faults are not laid to their charge because of their faith in Christ, for otherwise no flesh should be saved. We conclude, therefore, upon these words. It was imputed to him for righteousness, that righteousness indeed beginneth through faith, and by the same we have the first fruits of the Spirit. But because faith is weak, it is not made perfect without God's imputation. Wherefore, faith beginneth righteousness, but imputation maketh it perfect unto the day of Christ. The popish sophisters and schoolmen dispute also of imputation, when they speak of the good acceptation of the work, but beside and cling contrary to the scripture, for they rest it only to works. They do not consider the uncleanness and inward poison lurking in the heart, as incredulity, doubting, condemning, and hating of God, which most pernicious and perilous beasts are the fountain and cause of all mischief. They consider no more but outward and gross faults and unrighteousness, which are little rivers proceeding and issuing out of those fountains. Therefore they attribute acceptance to works, that is to say, that God doth accept our works, not of duty, but of congruence. Contrariwise, we, excluding all works, do go to the very head of this beast, which is called reason, which is the fountain and headspring of all mischiefs. For reason feareth not God, it loveth not God, it trusteth not in God, but proudly condemneth him. It is not moved with his threatenings or his promises, it is not delighted with his words or works, but it murmureth against him, it is angry with him, and judgeth and hateth him. To be short, it is an enemy to God. Romans chapter 8 verse 7 Not giving him his glory. This pestilent beast, reason, I say, being once slain, all outward and gross vices should be nothing. Wherefore, we must first and before all things go about by faith to kill infidelity, the contempt and hating of God, and murmuring against his judgment, his wrath, and all his words and works. For then do we kill reason, which can be killed by none other means but by faith, which in believing God giveth unto him his glory, notwithstanding that he speaketh those things which seem both foolish, absurd, and impossible unto reason, notwithstanding also that God setteth forth himself otherwise than reason is able either to judge or to conceive, that is to say, after this manner, I will account and pronounce thee as righteous, not for the keeping of the law, not for thy works and thy merits, but for thy faith in Jesus Christ, mine only begotten Son, who was born, suffered, was crucified, and died for thy sins. And that sin which remaineth in thee, I will not impute unto thee. If reason then be not killed, and all kinds of religion, and all services of God under heaven, that are invented by men, to get righteousness before God, be not condemned. The righteousness of faith cannot take place. When reason heareth this, by and by it is offended. It rageth and uttereth all her malice against God, saying, Are then my good works nothing? Have I then laboured and borne the heat of the day in vain? Matthew chapter 20, verse 11. Hereof ariseth those uproars of nations, of kings and princes, against the Lord and against his Christ. Psalm 2. For the world neither will nor can suffer that his wisdom, righteousness, religions, and worshippings should be reproved and condemned. The Pope, with all his popish rabblement, will not seem to err, much less will he suffer himself to be condemned. Wherefore, let those which give themselves to the study of the Holy Scripture learn out of it this saying, quote, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. End quote. 
to set forth truly and rightly this true Christian righteousness after this manner, that it is a faith and confidence in the Son of God, or rather, a confidence of the heart in God through Christ Jesus. And let them add this clause as a difference, which faith and confidence is accounted righteousness for Christ's sake. For these two things, as I said before, work Christian righteousness, namely faith in the heart, which is a gift of God, and assuredly believeth in Christ, and also that God accepteth this imperfect faith for perfect righteousness for Christ's sake, in whom I have begun to believe. Because of this faith in Christ, God seeth not my doubting of his good will towards me, my distrust, my heaviness of spirit, and other sins which are yet in me. For as long as I live in the flesh, sin is truly in me. But because I am covered under the shadow of Christ's wings, as is the chicken under the wing of the hen, and dwell without all fear under that most ample and large heaven of the forgiveness of sins which is spread over me, God covereth and pardoneth the remnant of sin in me. That is to say, because of that faith wherewith I began to lay hold upon Christ, he accepteth my imperfect righteousness, even for perfect righteousness, and counteth my sin for no sin, which, notwithstanding, is sin indeed. So we shroud ourselves under the covering of Christ's flesh, who is, quote, our cloudy pillar for the day, and our pillar of fire for the night, end quote. Exodus chapter 8 verse 21. Lest God should see our sin. And although we see it, and for the time do feel the terrors of conscience, yet fleeing unto Christ, our mediator and reconciler, through whom we are made perfect, we are sure and safe. For as all things are in him, so through him we have all things, which also doth supply whatsoever is wanting in us. When we believe this, God winketh at the sins and remnants of sin yet sticking in our flesh, and so covereth them as if they were no sins. Because, saith he, thou believest in my Son, although thou have many sins, yet notwithstanding, they shall be forgiven thee, until thou be clean delivered from them by death. Let Christians learn with all diligence to understand this article of Christian righteousness, and to this end let them read Paul, and read him again both often and with great diligence, and let them compare the first with the last, yea, let them compare Paul wholly and fully with himself. Then shall they find it to be true that Christian righteousness consisteth in these two things, namely in faith, which giveth glory unto God, and in God's imputation. For faith is weak, as I have said, and therefore God's imputation must needs be joined with all. That is to say, that God will not lay to our charge the remnant of sin, that he will not punish it, nor condemn us for it, but will cover it and freely forgive it, as though it were nothing at all, not for our sake, nor for our worthiness and works, but for Jesus Christ's sake, in whom we believe. Thus a Christian man is both righteous and a sinner, holy and profane, an enemy of God, and yet a child of God. These contraries no sophister will admit, for they know not the true manner of justification. And this was the cause why they constrained men to work well so long, until they should feel in themselves no sin at all, whereby they gave occasion to many, which, striving with all their endeavour to be perfectly righteous, could not attain thereunto, to become stark mad. Yea, an infinite number also of those which were the authors of this devilish opinion, at the hour of death, were driven to desperation. Which thing had happened unto me also, if Christ had not mercifully looked upon me, and delivered me out of this terror. Contrariwise, we teach and comfort the afflicted sinner after this manner. Brother, it is not possible for thee to become so righteous in this life, that thou shouldst feel no sin at all, that thy body should be clear like the sun, without spot or blemish. But thou hast yet wrinkles and spots, and yet art thou holy, notwithstanding. But thou wilt say, How can I be holy when I have and feel sin in me? I answer, in that thou dost feel and acknowledge thy sin, it is a good token. Give thanks to God, and despair not. It is one step of health, when the sick man doth acknowledge and confess his infirmity. But how shall I be delivered from sin? Run to Christ, the physician, which healeth them that are broken in heart, and saveth sinners. Follow not the judgment of reason, which telleth thee that he is angry with sinners, but kill reason, and believe in Christ. If thou believe, 
thou art righteous, because thou givest glory to God, that he is almighty, merciful, true, and so on, and thou justifiest and praisest God. To be brief, thou yieldest unto him his divinity, and whatsoever else belongeth unto him, and the sin which remaineth in thee is not laid to thy charge, but is pardoned, for Christ's sake, in whom thou believest, who is perfectly just, whose righteousness is thy righteousness, and thy sin his sin. Here we see that every Christian is a high priest, for first he offereth up and killeth his own reason and the wisdom of the flesh. Then he giveth glory to God, that he is righteous, true, patient, pitiful, and merciful. And this is that daily sacrifice of the New Testament which must be offered evening and morning. The evening sacrifice is to kill reason. The morning sacrifice is to glorify God. Thus a Christian daily and continually is occupied in this double sacrifice and in the exercise thereof. And no man is able to set forth sufficiently the excellency and dignity of this Christian sacrifice. This is therefore a strange and wonderful definition of Christian righteousness, that it is the imputation of God for righteousness, or unto righteousness, because of our faith in Christ, or for Christ's sake. When the popish skill men hear this definition, they laugh at it, for they imagine that righteousness is a certain quality poured into the soul, and afterwards spread into all the parts of man. They cannot put away the vain imaginations of reason, which teacheth that a right judgment and a good will, or a good intent, is true righteousness. This unspeakable gift, therefore, excelleth all reason, that God doth account and acknowledge him for righteous, without works, which embraceth his Son by faith alone, who was sent into the world, was born, suffered, and was crucified for us. This matter, as touching the words, is easy, to wit, that righteousness is not essentially in us, as the papist reason out of Aristotle, but without us, in the grace of God only, and in his imputation, and that there is no essential substance of righteousness in us, besides that weak faith, or first fruits of faith, whereby we have begun to apprehend Christ. And yet sin, in the meantime, remaineth verily in us. But in very deed, it is no small or light matter, but weighty and of great importance. For Christ, which was given for us, and whom we apprehend by faith, hath done no small thing for us. But, as Paul said before, quote, he hath loved us and given himself in very deed for us. He was made accursed for us. End quote. Galatians chapter 2 verse 10 and chapter 3 verse 13. And this is no vain speculation, that Christ was delivered for my sins and was accursed for me, that I might be delivered from everlasting death. Therefore to apprehend that son by faith and with the heart to believe him given unto us, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, and for us of God, causeth that God doth account that faith, although it be imperfect, for perfect righteousness. And here we are altogether in another world, far from reason, where we dispute not what we ought to do, or with what grace we may deserve grace and forgiveness of sins, but we are in a matter of most high and heavenly divinity, where we do hear this gospel or glad tidings, that Christ died for us, and that we, believing this, are accounted righteous, those sins notwithstanding do remain in us, and that great sins. So our Saviour, Christ, also defineth the righteousness of faith. Quote, the Father, saith he, loveth you. End quote. Wherefore doth he love you? Not because ye were Pharisees, unreprovable in the righteousness of the law, circumcised, doing good works, fasting, and so on, but because I have chosen you out of the world, and ye have done nothing but that ye have loved me, and believed that I am come out from the Father. This object, I, being sent from the Father, pleased you. And because you have apprehended and embraced this object, therefore the Father loveth you, and therefore ye please him. And yet, notwithstanding, in another place he calleth them evil, and commandeth them to ask for the forgiveness of their sins. These two things are quite contrary, to wit, that a Christian is righteous and beloved of God, and yet, notwithstanding, he is a sinner. For God cannot deny his own nature, that is, he must needs hate sin and sinners, and this he doth of necessity, for otherwise he should be unrighteous and love sin. How then can these two contradictions stand together? 
I am a sinner, and most worthy of God's wrath and indignation, and yet the Father loveth me. Here nothing cometh between, but only Christ the Mediator. The Father, saith he, doth not therefore love you, because ye are worthy of love, but because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from him. Thus a Christian man abideth in true humility, feeling sin in him effectually, and confessing himself to be worthy of wrath, of the judgment of God, and of everlasting death for the same, that he may be humbled in this life. And yet notwithstanding, he continueth still in his pride, in the which he turneth unto Christ, and in him he lifteth up himself against this feeling of God's wrath and judgment, and believeth that not only the remnants of sin are not imputed unto him, but that also he is loved of the Father, not for his own sake, but for Christ's sake, whom the Father loveth. Hereby now we may see how faith justifieth without works, and yet notwithstanding, how imputation of righteousness is also necessary. Sins do remain in us, which God utterly hateth. Therefore it is necessary that we should have imputation of righteousness, which we obtain through Christ, and for his sake, who is given unto us and received of us by faith. In the meantime, as long as we live here, we are carried and nourished in the bosom of the mercy and long-sufferance of God, until the body of sin be abolished, and we raised up as new creatures in that great day. Then shall there be new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness shall dwell. In the meanwhile, under this heaven, sin and wicked men do dwell, and the godly also have sin dwelling in them. For this cause, Paul, Romans chapter 7, complaineth of sin which remaineth in the saints. Yet, notwithstanding, he saith afterwards, in the eighth chapter, quote, that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. End quote. Now, how shall these things, so contrary and repugnant, be reconciled together? That sin in us is no sin. That he which is damnable shall not be condemned. That he which is rejected shall not be rejected. That he which is worthy of the wrath of God and everlasting damnation shall not be punished. The only reconciler hereof is the mediator between God and man, even Jesus Christ. As Paul saith, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. End of section 26